If you want to support this channel and help me continue to share deep insight applicable to your life, you can buy me a coffee or a book with the link in the description. If my happiness at this moment consists largely in reviewing happy memories and expectations, I am but dimly aware of this present. I shall still be dimly aware of the present when the good things that I have been expecting come to pass, for I shall have formed a habit of looking behind and ahead, making it difficult for me to attend to the here and now. If, then, my awareness of the past and future makes me less aware of the present, I must begin to wonder whether I am actually living in the real world. We are accustomed to make our existence worthwhile by the belief that something good is about to come soon. We chase a bright and secure future in order to feel relieved in the present. Yet, if your happiness in the present depends on the security of your future, you are doomed to be unhappy for most of your life, for the future is all but certain. How many people think that they have their lives figured out only to face an existential crisis? How many believe that they have found a stable job only to be laid off during a financial crisis? These thoughts may stir up your anxiety, but that's doomed to happen eventually. According to the philosopher Alan Watts, our attempts to achieve security are futile, as they only lead to greater anxiety. Watts argues that insecurity is an inherent part of human experience. Perhaps, then, security isn't what we should be looking for. The only sane alternative to looking for security, according to Watts, is to stop looking, for what we seek is found somewhere we cannot struggle toward, the present. In his book The Wisdom of Insecurity, Watts describes how we sometimes envy the animals. They appear to live in a carefree state where instinct rather than anxiety governs their lives. For the animal to be happy, it is enough that this moment be enjoyable. But man is hardly satisfied with this at all. He is much more concerned to have enjoyable memories and expectations, especially the latter. With these assured, he can put up with an extremely miserable present. Without this assurance, he can be extremely miserable in the midst of immediate physical pleasure. Watts gives the example of a man who knows that in two weeks' time he must undergo a surgical operation. He experiences no physical pain in the meantime, and he is surrounded by the affection of friends and family while doing a job that is normally of great interest to him. Yet he lives in constant dread. He is insensitive to the immediate realities around him, preoccupied with something that is not yet here something that is not even real, a mere thought. It's not as if he were making plans for his family should the operation go wrong, as these have already been made. Rather, he is pointlessly stressing over the operation, and his worry is ruining his present enjoyment of life while contributing nothing to the solution of any problem. The object of your dread may not be an operation. It may be the problem of next month's rent, a war or social disaster waiting to happen, or of saving money for old age. Though it is useful to plan in order to face such problems, to think about the future without being grounded in what is present remains an absurd waste of life. After all, the future is quite meaningless and unimportant unless, sooner or later, it becomes the present. As Watts says, it is of little use to us to be able to remember and predict if it makes us unable to live fully in the present. What is the use of planning to be able to eat next week unless I can really enjoy the meals when they come? Anxiety may help us survive, but it prevents us from living. Living in a constant projection toward the future leads people to study in order to find a stable job, to work in order to ensure retirement, and to retire with the habit of always postponing life to some later time. The absurdity here lies in the inability to be aware of the present when the good things that you have been expecting come to pass. This condition is comparable to suicide, for one is literally living just to arrive at death throwing away the time in between, and therefore, one's existence. An animal with no cognition of yesterday or tomorrow lives more fully than such a human. The difference between us and the animals is, therefore, our consciousness of time. This awareness grants us the gift of foresight, but, on the other hand, it traps us in a made-up world disconnected from what is real now. The power of memories and expectations is such that for most human beings the past and the future are not as real, but more real than the present. The present cannot be lived happily unless the past has been cleared up and the future is bright with promise. Past and future are therefore an illusion. They are mere thoughts that distract us from the real present moment. When we think of time, we are living in our heads, for time happens purely in our minds. It is merely the comparison of memories and thoughts. 
What does exist, however, is the flowing process of change that gives rise to the perception of time and which we experience at every moment. Past and future do not exist, but the ever-changing present does. It is quite cliché to hear live in the present, or the present is all you have, and those who say it often do not understand the weight of their words. The present is an infinitesimal yet eternal moment that is in constant change. It is impossible to measure it, for the instant you begin it has already passed, yet it is all that ever exists, for everything exists within it. To be grounded in the present moment is to be connected with the root of existence. To show you how significant the present moment is, Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh compares living in the present moment to entering the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is available to you in the here and the now, but the question is whether you are available to the kingdom. Our practice is to make ourselves ready for the kingdom so that it can manifest in the here and the now. You don't need to die in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, you have to be truly alive in order to do so. But before we understand the richness of the present moment, we must first understand the full extent of the illusion in which we live. Time is not the only notion that prevents us from connecting to what is real. Watts argues that we further trap ourselves in the illusion of our thoughts by replacing the real present world with words. Our whole lives are mediated by words. We use them to communicate and to describe the world to others and to ourselves. This over-reliance on words leads us to mistake the symbols we use to describe and predict the world with the world itself, veiling us from the ineffable experience of reality. You cannot understand life and its mysteries as long as you try to grasp it. Indeed, you cannot grasp it, just as you cannot walk off with a river in a bucket. If you try to capture running water in a bucket, it is clear that you do not understand it, and that you will always be disappointed, for in the bucket the water does not run. According to Watts, words and thoughts are social conveniences. It is easier to say I than to point to your own body and to say want than to try to indicate a vague feeling in the mouth. It is more convenient to say water than to bring your friend over to a well and make gestures. It is convenient for us to use the same words to represent the same things, though those things are always changing. Words, then, cannot describe the most important characteristic of life, its movement and fluidity. Watts uses the metaphor of money to illustrate this paradox. Money is used to represent wealth, but it is not at all like real wealth, for you cannot eat, sleep, or shelter yourself with it. Just like wealth does not represent the perishability or edibility of food, so words and thoughts do not represent the vitality of life. You do not define this real living something by associating it with the noise man. When we say this is a man, the thing to which we point is not man. To be clearer, we should have said this is symbolized by the noise man. What then is this? We do not know. That is to say, we cannot define it in any fixed way though, in another sense, we know it as our immediate experience, a flowing process without definable beginning or end. Now that we have seen what the illusion consists of, we can begin to understand the reality behind it. Reality, or life, is what lies beyond words and thoughts. It is a flowing process only known through experience. It is what you are going through right now. Life, change, movement, and insecurity are so many names for the same thing. That thing, though, is ineffable. Watts reminds us that by trying to understand everything in terms of memory, the past, and words, we have had our noses in the guidebook for most of our lives, and have never looked at the view. The use of language and abstract thought is like a veil placed upon the world, preventing us from seeing the reality of life. Life used to be experienced when men like Adam saw things before they named them. Today, we name things before we see them. What lies outside of the illusion, therefore, cannot be talked or thought about. Through words, I can only tell you what is not that reality, so that you may become aware of what's left. But it is only your experience, your very existence, that can reveal the eternal present moment, and you have to do absolutely nothing to reach it. You are already here. You cannot be in the present by trying, for to try implies to struggle towards some future state of things. How, then, do you lose yourself in the present moment without trying? You already do it, especially when you experience pleasure without any worry. You are one with the experience, one with the great stream of life. But the moment that you feel pain, or you suspect that the pleasure you are experiencing can end, you tend to suddenly begin to analyze the experience and look onto the future. Your mind splits in two, 
on one side is a separate and independent I, and on the other is the experience that I is having. But the self, in this sense, is just another thought made up of memories, disconnected from what you are right now. You're listening to a song. Suddenly I ask, at this moment, who are you? How will you answer this question immediately and spontaneously without stopping to find words? If the question does not shock you out of listening, you will answer by humming the song. If the question surprised you, you will answer, at this moment, who are you? But if you stop to think, you will try to tell me not about this moment, but about the past. To think is to be detached from the present. Detaching yourself from the present protects you from pain and allows you to plan for the prolongation or repetition of pleasure. But in doing so, you try to make permanent those things which are only enjoyable because they are changing. In other words, the more we struggle for life, the more we are killing what we love. The antithesis to that is the complete acceptance of all experiences, both pleasant and unpleasant, with the awareness that one implies the existence of the other. Indeed, you cannot have pleasure without also experiencing pain. The two must in some way alternate, for pleasure can only either increase or cease, and its constant increase becomes pain, just like a diet of rich foods makes one sick. Our increased sensitivity to pain and pleasure is the price that we must pay for the increase in our consciousness. It is that consciousness which allows us to make a full experience of existence, for neither minerals, nor vegetables, nor animals have the existential awareness that we do. We must therefore not resist insecurity. Insecurity is just another name for this moving process which we call life, but which in truth cannot be boiled down to a simple word. To try to prevent insecurity is to try to stop life. No wonder that doing so causes us even more suffering. By letting go of your fixation on security, you begin to feel alive. You touch the essence of here and now, that is, the essence of existence, the whole meaning of life. In such a state you are the experience, without any separate I that is having the experience, for the self is just another thought that you are having in the present. There is also nothing to chase in the future, because it too is just a thought. The substance of life is here and now, and you can already touch it. Thou art already that. When you realize that you live in, that indeed you are this moment now, and no other, that apart from this there is no past and no future, you must relax and taste to the full, whether it be pleasure or pain. At once it becomes obvious why this universe exists, why conscious beings have been produced, why sensitive organs, why space, time, change. The whole problem of justifying nature, of trying to make life mean something in terms of its future, disappears utterly. Obviously, it all exists for this moment. It is a dance, and when you are dancing you are not intent on getting somewhere. You go round and round, but not under the illusion that you are pursuing something or fleeting from the jaws of hell. The meaning and purpose of dancing is the dance. Like music also, it is fulfilled in each moment of its course. You do not play a sonata in order to reach the final chord. There is one last question that we must touch before ending this video, that is the question of death. Our insecurity ultimately springs from our awareness of death, which proceeds from our awareness of time. How then do we deal with the ultimate cessation of expectations, the entrance into the absolute unknown? In life we know that our future is uncertain, but we have a relative certainty of the type of experiences that we will have. Death, however, remains a complete mystery, the greatest one of life. When each moment becomes an expectation, life is deprived of fulfillment and death is dreaded for it seems that here expectation must come to an end. But to the undivided mind, death is another moment, complete like every moment, and cannot yield its secrets unless lived to the full. Death is the epitome of the truth that in each moment we are thrust into the unknown. Here all clinging to security is compelled to cease, and wherever the past is dropped away and safety abandoned, life is renewed. Death is the unknown in which all of us lived before birth. Precisely because our awareness of death comes from our awareness of time, death as we can think or talk about it is another illusion of our thoughts. To the mind who lives in the eternal present moment, there cannot be such a thing as death. Once you realize your own existence, that indeed you are real and present in this moment, you understand that you cannot die, for you are part of a universe that goes beyond time. Before you were born, you were dead. Then, from death, you came forth and became alive, just like an apple that grows out of a tree used to be the tree, and will one day become many more trees. 
Through death comes life, and life cannot be unless death follows, for the stream of existence requires the constituents of life to be perishable and ephemeral in order to be renewed and flow. Thus, death is a normal, necessary experience of life, for it renews life, giving rise to its transformations. Death is life. To look unto death as the continuation of the stream is to become liberated of all insecurity. It is to fall in love with insecurity, for insecurity also is life. It is to understand that the meaning of life is always arrived at in the present moment, as what says that obviously it all exists for this moment. Life requires no future to complete itself, nor explanation to justify itself. In this moment, it is finished. Your support means the world to me, so make sure to like, subscribe and share this video with whoever might need it. Thank you.